I have to admit it's a bit intimidating in front of this group of spiritual giants here. And the Super Bowl's been going for five minutes now. And <laughs> you people are at a church meeting. What's wrong with you? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Well, just to refresh, uh, we're starting John 2 this week. Last week we uh, left off in John 1, and we saw John the Baptist calling Christ the Lamb of God. And um, we saw some of the first disciples introduced. And I made the point to show that the disciples were not, you know, they were simple men, but they weren't a bunch of uh, ignorant rubes. They knew some things about their, their Bible and looking for their Messiah. And I've had it mentioned to me recently that... Um, Folks have been enjoying the topical studies that we much more than the verse-by-verse -verse studies, to which I would say, I know, <laughs> topical's more fun, but we all need to eat our vegetables, right, moms? So, but verse-by-verse -verse is important because it protects us from people who would come to take you to your Bible and try to proof text it or tell stories or advance their agenda. When you've studied it verse-by-verse, -verse, like, you'll be able to spot the guy who's trying to push you where the text won't take you. So it's important. But as we start chapter 2, I, you know, you guys know my background. I grew up in Christian school and, and all that. And there's still inside of me this ornery 13-year-old boy sitting in Bible study class, you know, elbowing your buddy. So I'm reading chapter 2. And the first part, you have Jesus making a bunch of wine. And the second part, he's trashing the temple, you know. So there's this thing. <laughs> oh, <that funny. laughs> you know, so let's get that out of the way. Yuck, yuck. <laughs> Jesus did not get drunk and trash the temple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was the fullness of the Godhead body, bodily. He knew no sin. Um, but just to get that out of the way, beat uh, the young men to the punch. <laughs> but uh, this chapter 2 is a very controversial chapter in your Bible, depending on which preacher you go to. Some of the stuff in this chapter is enough to send your fundamentalist preacher into a holy snit. Like how, I mean, it's, it's hilarious to read some of the commentaries. You can just hear the anger in their voices. They're commentating on it. Because you know? it's a miracle and it involves wine. So that's what we're going to go into tonight. You know, Jesus would never make booze. I would, Jesus, have you, I don't hang out with people who smeak, drink, smoke, or chew, or hang with those that do, or whatever. So they get, the, they get upset about it, and then they tell stories about how, oh, there's new wine, and then there's old wine, and the new wine's not alcoholic, and it ferments after time, and, you know, on and on and on and on. But, and then on the other hand, <laughs> you see the guy who wants to justify the fact that he drinks three gallons of moonshine a day. <laughs> See, Jesus made wine, he made lots of it, you know, you got that guy going. So, people push their agendas here, and I'm not here to push an agenda tonight, I'm here to study and rightly divide, so we have to start, start with the fact that you don't know whether the wine was alcoholic or not. It's not in the text. You don't know. Um, you don't know whether it was 90 proof or zero proof wine, it's not recorded. So to fight on that kind of an agenda is kind of a waste of time because it's not even listed. You can't prove it. Um, but the, the, me as a mid ex Pauline dispensational right divider, when I come to it and I see if you focus on the wine and whether or not it was hooch or whether or not it was Welch's grape juice, you know, <laughs> You're missing the whole point of the chapter, and I would have loved to have a whiteboard with me tonight to uh, write this out on, but you have to use your brain or use your outline on it. But let's go ahead and read the, uh, the first 11 verses here. That's the verses we're going to cover this evening. And in chapter 2, verse 1, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, now that's not, hey man, I want some wine. It's, they wanted in your Bible can mean lacked. They lacked wine. They're having a marriage, you have wine in a marriage. They didn't have any. They wanted wine. The mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. Huh? What's that about? We'll get to that later. Funny question, though. 
My hour is not yet come. Verse 5, his mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set six water pots, set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. So I did the math on this. What is a firkin? I don't know. I looked it up. Compared, you know, you got to go with the average because it says two or three firkins apiece. Um, with taking the firkin, the average firkin, and, and what we have now, we would know now as a bottle of wine. That's about 800 and some bottles of wine in the pots. Okay, we got to It's going to be a party. <laughs> uh, that's a lot of wine. But uh, verse seven, Jesus saith unto them, "Fill the water pots with water." You think these guys are like, okay? And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, "Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast." And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. That's where the guys who want to booze all night, they will take you there saying, See? See? You bring out the... Budweiser, and you bring out the uh, Yingling at the beginning, and you save, you know, the Milwaukee's best for the. <laughs> you know. But that aside, once again, you don't know whether the wine was alcoholic or not. Um, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. In verse 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So you see, once again, there, the, the point of the miracle is to engender belief. In the disciples. But before we move on, that last verse, verse 11, the beginning of miracles. Um, if you have cable, National Geographic, you know, um, Learning Channel, well, no, Learning Channel doesn't have any learning on it anymore, it's just reality TV. You know, those science channels and history channels and that kind of thing, you'll see advertisements, you know, Sunday, the real Jesus. Do you know the real Jesus? What don't you know about who Jesus was? And those programs, invariably, they're going to go back to one of the false gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Rick or the Gospel of, you know, whoever. And in those, those books, which are not Bible, which are not inspired, you'll see stories of Jesus as a child doing miracles. There's one where, you know, he transforms his friend into a bird or something like that, and then he kills the bird. And, you know, there's, there's stories, you know, miracle. all these gospels have, like, the lost years, the forgotten years, that you don't know anything about Jesus. Well, you know those aren't true because you have John 1.11 here. It says this was the first one. This was the beginning of miracles. So he didn't do any miracles before this one. So that's how you know that those books are not uh, inspired scripture. So sorry to National Geographic's ratings and History Channel. The Gospel of Rick is not God's word. <laughs> and it's not reliable. But... When you, when you know what Christ was here to do and you know who he was, when you come to, to something like this, I, I don't know how your guys' mind think, but I, why, out of all the miraculous things you can do, I mean, you want to open with a bang, right? Why would you choose to change water into wine at a wedding? What's, what's the point of that? I mean, you could have done something, you could have just gone to the wedding and started flying. <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm flying, you know? Could have healed an amputee or something, you know. Um, done something really amazing. Super Bowl's now been going for 15 minutes. Could have my beloved Cleveland Browns in the Super Bowl. Now that's a miracle. <laughs> but uh, why, why make the water into wine? It's 70 dozen bottles of wine. And, you know, this, this miracle, too, is, is amazing because you know, my kids like they're learning to do magic tricks and they're learning the sleight of hand thing. You know, and even with the, the greatest illusionists in the world, you know, your David Copperfields and those kind of guys, there's always that sleight of hand moment or the, the curtain moves for a second. You know, there's always that moment where you know, okay, this is not real because they had to hide what they were doing over there. But when you look at this miracle, Jesus didn't do anything. He just stood there, told the guys what to do, didn't touch anything. Didn't abracadabra, kazam, it's wine. No, he didn't do anything like that. He didn't even say any words. He just said, 
go fill them up with water. Can you imagine what those guys were thinking? Like, what's up with this guy? <laughs> Mom just said they needed wine, and we're going to get, you know, 800 bottles of water. What's this guy all about? And then Jesus says, draw out some. So they draw some out. And he goes, now go take it to the governor of the feast, you know, the head honcho of the feast. Can you imagine what those guys, you know, we're taking water up to the head table, right? Mephibosheth? I know Ezekiel. <laughs> well, what's our out? <laughs> His mom told us, whatever he, we're just doing, sorry, you know, but you can imagine what they're, and then they pour it out and it's wine. Whoa. Jesus didn't touch anything, didn't say anything. I mean, it was just like mind bullets. You know, he thought, change, change from water into a substance that comes from grapes and fruit and just that's, that's an amazing uh, miracle that he did there. But um, when, you, when you look at the story of the water into wine, it's a funny thing. Like, why? Why that? Well, what happens, and because I have these programs and these commentaries, people don't really know what to do with this because they don't know anything about right division. So they have to start telling stories. And the stories get very emotional and... They start telling stories about, you know, the best is going to be last, and things may not be the greatest now, but God's got something great for you in your life, and he's going to bless your socks off. And what happens is you miss the whole point, once again, and what's the, the point of, of what this is about. And I have an encyclopedia. It's an encyclopedia of 7,700 sermon illustrations. There are boatloads of illustrations for this section here, because... What do you do with it? It's a weird miracle. Why? Um, so I'm not going to be telling stories tonight. You know, I'm not good on that. But what I want to do, when I come to something like this, I want to understand what's going on, why, and what's the point of it all. That's the way my mind works. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, so let's unpack this little miracle. You have on your outlines uh, enough of a list where I think you can mentally keep going with this, but when you study your Bible and you have something like this and it doesn't make sense, you, what you can do is you can go to free computer programs and do word searches. You can, you know, coming into John, okay, I'm at the Old Testament. Uh, Christ is coming to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's talking about their kingdom. So that's the context I'm dealing with. So then do a word search and see what comes up in that context. So the first thing is, Jesus goes to a wedding. Okay, Jesus is at a wedding, and there's no wine, and he miracles a boatload of it. <laughs> Enough to get half the town drunk if it's alcoholic. <laughs> you know? But when you're talking about a miracle, and we, our day and age, a miracle is, the word has just been cheapened. What's a miracle? A miracle is something that breaks the laws of physics. Something, I mean, you're big into science, you see somebody break the laws of physics in front of you, okay, that's a miracle. I know that can't happen outside of something supernatural. It breaks the laws of physics, breaks the laws of biology, um, time, breaking the laws of time. Those are all standard things that Jesus broke you know, throughout the Bible, miracles. So water suddenly becoming not water, but a completely different substance, that's a miracle. So why did he choose this as his first miracle? Once again, the context. John 2. Jesus is not trying to prove anything to you and me. He's not trying to teach direct doctrine to you and me. So we know that. We know that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. We know that from Matthew 5. And the law and the prophets were to Israel, not to you and I. But... Um, the why of the miracle that's recorded. And we saw a peak of it a couple weeks ago in John 20 at the end of the book because John only records uh, eight miracles. I mean, you go, to, you go to some other of the Gospels and it's miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. After miracle. But John's only puts in eight. Some people say seven, but I think the fish thing at the end of the book, I would call that probably a miracle as well. But... In John 20, verse 30, he tells you, I didn't write everything down. 
You didn't, you didn't hear all the miracles. In 20 verse 30, he says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye, who's the ye? Israel, people that are going to believe on their Messiah, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So, I know that the reason this miracle is in the Bible, and the reason Christ did it, was to prove that I am Israel's Messiah. The, I am the prophesied Christ. And it's, the issue is not whether the wine was Welch's or booze. Okay? So, and miracles too. Understand that miracles teach. Miracles teach doctrine. Just like parables. Par parables are Christ spoke in parables to hide information from people who didn't believe. But people who had ears to hear They'd hear him saying, these, okay, I think I understand. And miracles work a lot the same way. You think about after the cross, what was Peter's first miracle that he did? Peter's out there preaching the kingdom. You know, we're all going to go in the kingdom. His first miracle is to heal a lame Jew. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Healing, you know, everything's going to be wonderful. And what's Paul's first miracle with the gospel of the grace of God, his first miracle is to blind an unbelieving Jew. What happens to Israel during our dispensation? Israel is blind. They're fallen. So miracles teach things. And that's an important thing to know when you look at, at sections like this in John, that they are, they are teaching things. So let's, let's just go down a list of things that you can tick off in these first 11 verses. And you can see, okay, maybe I should look into that. Number one, we've got a wedding, a marriage. And Jesus is there. Number two, there's no wine at the wedding. Number three thing we can see. The water is put in pots that was, were meant to purify the Jews. Okay, that may be, may be significant. Number four, the people didn't have any wine, but it was supernaturally provided for them. And the last point that we see here as we look to unpack this miracle is the second round of wine was better than the first round of wine. So those are interesting things to keep in mind of, hmm... Let's go look. So knowing that's the context, knowing who John's written to and, and what it's about, we can start going back and looking through the Bible. And this is how you study the Bible for yourself. Um, a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people just sit and listen to some other guy's Bible study. But we are commanded to study for ourselves, 2 Timothy 2.15. So what I can do is I can search, let's, Let's look at this marriage and Jesus at a marriage. Is there anything significant with that? Well, in Isaiah, what a surprise, Christ came to fulfill the law and the prophets, and I can find similar things in the law and the prophets. Uh, but Isaiah 62, remember Jesus is out preaching the kingdom, and I find in Isaiah 62 in verse 2, some stuff about a kingdom here. Uh, verse 2, And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. This sounds a lot like a kingdom. You know, no more trouble anymore, now it's going to be wonderful. Um, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah. And thy land Beulah, beautiful. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and here we go, and thy land shall be married. So I got the Lord and a marriage there. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. So, hmm. I'm trying to learn what this miracle is about. And I know I start with Jesus at a wedding. And then I go back into prophecy and I find a wedding having to do with all the sons and everybody coming into the kingdom. Okay, maybe this has something to do. Maybe he's trying to teach something about the kingdom here. Turn over to Matthew. That was from farther back in the Old Testament. Let's move forward in the Old Testament. Matthew 22. I said miracles are a lot like parables. We're going to look at a parable here. Matthew 22, 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven 
Hmm. Okay, so we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. Is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. So right there, can't, it's plain as day. He's likening the kingdom of heaven to a marriage. Look what he says about when he calls his servants. And they would not come. What did we learn in John 1? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Verse 4, again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Uh, come unto the marriage. So the kingdom of heaven is like unto a marriage. So, all right, that maybe Christ is trying to teach through this miracle, this oddball miracle, it would have been much more entertaining to fly, you know, but he's turning water into wine. Uh, he's trying to teach us something about this kingdom and this wedding. New Testament, Israel's New Testament, Revelation. Revelation 21. You see in the end of the prophetic program in Revelation 21, we of course will be in heavenly places and not participating in the event, but John says in Revelation 21, and I, I John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, Prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. A marriage. This city coming down, this kingdom city. Drop down to verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And what does he show him? He shows him the city. That great city, that holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. The, the city coming down in the kingdom. That's the Lamb's wife full of the saints and the prophetic program. So Christ at a marriage. Um, we know that it has to do with Israel getting their kingdom and the new Jerusalem and the city. So, <clears throat> you know, when you see Jesus at a wedding doing miraculous things, you should be thinking about Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled. Isn't that what he taught him to pray? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's what we're seeing here in this context. So you can see right off the bat there's more here than just whether or not the wine was grape juice or booze. So speaking of the wine, let's go to the wine. <laughs> um, wine's a funny thing. You can run four dozen references in your Bible talking about wine being bad and you know, wine is a mocker and that kind of thing. You can run four dozen verses in your Bible about wine in a good context. Um, so what we want to do is find out what the wine is in this context, in John. Um, in John 2. Now, you do word searches on wine in the Bible and it runs the gamut. Um, you could have the verse in Revelation 14 where, um, let me just read it. They shall drink the wine of the wrath of God. <laughs> I don't want that wine. <laughs> Uh, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. You can find verses like that where God's talking about, I'm treading the wine press of my wrath and I'm going to pour it out full. Now, that doesn't really work in the context of John's 2. We're, this is a happy occasion and people are happy and you know, we're not talking about that. But once again, trying to think like you're under a covenant. It's hard for us to think under a covenant because we understand grace. But under Israel's covenant, if things are going bad all around you, you can know um, we're messing up somehow. You know, if I don't, you know, my, my sheep are all skinny and they're not producing any furry. What's going on here? You know, you know that God's unhappy with you somehow. That's how a covenant context is. But in Israel's covenant, if they don't have corn and they don't have wine and things aren't, the ground isn't bringing forth, they're, they're having a bad day. They're not performing well according to their covenant. And I think that fits more in the John 2 context of here we're at this marriage and we have no wine. Well, we're God's chosen people. You know, we're the covenant people of God. We should be being blessed. We should never have lack for anything. Of course, wine in a marriage. So that's, that's how I see that here in this. But um, in Deuteronomy 7, you don't have to turn to this, but in Deuteronomy 7, when he's outlining the covenant, and he says, you know, if you're going to keep my statutes and keep my commandments, he says... And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine. So if Israel's at a wedding with no wine, God's not blessing them. 
something's, something's terribly wrong here. So, and even back, there's going to be a section in your Bible right behind Matthew where all the gold uh, is still fresh and clean on the sides because you never turn to it. That's where you'll find Hosea. I'm the first one there. <laughs> I bookmarked it, right? <laughs> Hosea 2 and chapter 8. You see this as a, a judgment having no wine. And this is God talking about how Israel's failed the covenant. Um, it says, For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold. What did they do with all that stuff that God gave them? They prepared it for Baal. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty much breaking the covenant hardcore. Take the stuff that God gave you and give it to a false god. Way to go. But then uh, verse 9 says, Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof. So they're going to get judged. I'll turn forward a couple pages to Joel. Joel 1, in verse 9. Once again, we're talking about the wine, and what's the significance of the wine? At the, more, more, what is the significance of a lack of wine at this wedding? The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. I have no wine. It's a type, it's a sign. And once again, you've got to remember, Jesus was God in the flesh. He didn't, you know, wake up one morning and go, man, what am I going to do today? What miracle can I do? Oh, you know, everything he did was according to a plan and a purpose of God fulfilling prophecy. Every word he said, every action he took was foreordained and planned and had a purpose. So don't let any of this stuff be wasted on you. All these specific things in this chapter are important. We see here that this wine, this lack of wine, is a, is a big deal for Israel. Who, can, who thinks it could find Haggai? Don't worry about it. We're running late. <laughs> Let me just read it to you. Haggai 1.7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Verse 11. So he's saying, consider your ways. Let's, let's see how you're doing here, Israel. Let's take stock of how you're doing. Verse 11, and I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil. So they said, consider your ways, guys. How are you doing? I called for a drought on all this stuff. You're failing the covenant. So Jesus at a marriage with no wine, we could see that Jesus is talking. It's like the kingdom of heaven, this marriage and these, this kingdom that's coming and the fact that they have no wine is teaching that they've failed their end of the covenant. They don't have what they need for the marriage. Okay, so let's move on now to the pots. Purifying pots. There's, he says, fill them up with water. Fill up these purifying pots. Six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. Now you know that the Jews had all the diverse washings and baptisms and rituals and the priests, they had to be washed and shaved and there was all this water washing with running water. And they had these pots to purify themselves according to that manner. And you know, the promise from all the way back in Exodus 19, when Charlton Heston is getting the law, and he says, I will make you a kingdom of priests. A whole kingdom of priests. Not a great kingdom with some good priests. You're going to be a whole kingdom, every one of you. And I will make you a holy nation. So that was what they said. Yep, we'll do that. We'll keep that covenant. They never did. They couldn't. They couldn't do it. They couldn't keep the law. But the, in the Old Testament purifying, over in Numbers, he says you're going to be a whole kingdom of priests. Well, you have these washings that the priests had to do. Just mentioned it a second ago, Numbers 8, 7. And he's talking about what you're going to do with the Levites, who are the priests. And he says, and thus shalt thou do to them, to cleanse them, to clean them, to purify them maybe. Sprinkle water of purifying upon them and let them shave all their flesh and let them wash their clothes and make themselves clean. So in order to be a priest, you have to be washed clean with this purifying water. And Jesus 
There's significance there where Jesus takes this water from these purifying pots and he changes it into something completely different. Completely different substance. What's he trying to show? What's he trying to demonstrate here? Um, and like I said, the Jews told the biggest lie of the of history when they said that they would keep that covenant and they would do that law. Uh, they were never pure. They were never a holy nation. They broke it more than they kept it. So the question you have to ask when you see this, Jesus changing this purifying water into something else, what can purify the Jews? The water didn't work. Water didn't wash them clean. So by Jesus changing the water into something completely different, um, he would be trying to teach them that the Old Testament washings and baptisms and rituals and everything, they won't work for the marriage that they're called to. You know, if that water would have stayed water and got to the governor of the feast, you know, what are you doing? You bring, we call for wine and you bring water? So Jesus is trying to show them that this purifying water, not going to cut it. Not going to cut it for this marriage you're, you're coming to and you've been invited to. So the last couple points. Uh, the people didn't have any of the wine and it was supernaturally provided for them. And the second round of wine was better than the first round of wine. What's that about? We've got, now that we've seen that it's about a kingdom here, um, we've got there that the, the water wouldn't, wouldn't, wasn't right for purifying. What about this wine and it was provided for him? Turn over to Matthew. Matthew 26. Matthew 26, you know you're getting late, late in the game there in Jesus' earthly ministry. Matthew 26 and verse... 27. They're having dinner together. They're having the Passover dinner. And what does Jesus say? He took the cup, cup of what? Cup of wine. And gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it. For this wine here is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So Jesus is using this cup of wine as a type saying, This is my blood, which is going to be shed for many. <coughs> but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the day that when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So he's likening this wine glass to this is what's going to buy you the New Testament. This wine, his blood. By the way, that funny question, that he, the funny thing that he said to his mom, what do I have to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. That's what he's talking about. My hour, this is when I'm going to spill my blood to buy that New Testament. My hour has not yet come. So Israel needed something. He, what he's teaching through this miracle is Israel needed something to purify them that you can't find in the Old Testament law. The blood of bulls and goats is not going to do. You need a better blood. You need God's blood. And that's even been prophesied. You know, I, I quote Jeremiah 31, 31 all the time. It talks about, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. So, the old stuff is going to go away. The water pots, the purifying water pots, that's going to be done away. It's got to be changed into something new with this blood that I'm going to spill. And this covenant, he says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. So that's very simple. They broke it. What do you do when you've broken a covenant? You're done. You broke it. You can't, you can't, Unbreak what you've broken. You needed something new. Israel needed the New Testament. But then he says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I will supernaturally provide you with something. Just like he supernaturally provided them the wine at the marriage when they didn't have any wine. I will supernaturally provide it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So he's got this supernatural intervention to purify folks who can't purify themselves. Just like the water couldn't purify, just like they couldn't, they didn't have wine, he provided it. That's what I see in John 2 when I'm seeing this miracle here. Last but not least, <clears throat> turn over to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36. It's, it's pretty much restating what, what we just read in Jeremiah. 
But in 36, verse 25, he says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness. Remember what we have in our mind. What can purify the Jews? What can purify the Jews? Well, God's doing it. God's providing the purification. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. I will provide the way. A new heart also will I give you. I will provide it. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit. You see, it's I'm doing all this stuff because you can't do it on your own. Israel, you need a Messiah. You need a Savior. Repent. That's the message of the Gospels. And he says, I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Verse 29, I will save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. Why would he need to? Because they're going to be walking in his statutes. There's no need for a famine. So God's providing all that. So when you look at the wine, and you look at these, all these things in this chapter, when I see this miracle, I see Jesus is trying to teach them um, the wine is a type of the blood, and you see that as them providing them the Holy Spirit, which they're able to walk in his statutes. I mean, you saw that in Acts 2. Everybody's selling all their stuff and living in a commune, and everybody's getting along. You can't do that unless you're loving your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't work unless you have God's Holy Spirit in you. So that's, that is a, it's a, uh, a type of how God's going to supernaturally provide Israel their New Testament, their better blood. And they're going to have, finally, the ability to keep their promise, what they said all the way back in Exodus 19. Yep, we'll do that. We'll be your kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They'll finally be able to do that. So, um, lastly, the second round of wine being better than the first round of wine. Don't let that be wasted on you. Um, you know, there's the law of first things in your Bible. You know, there's the first man, Adam. Well, he blew it. Well, the last Adam... He's the Savior. You know, there's the law. Of, you see that a lot in your Bible where the first thing is wrong, but the second thing is better. Same with Israel. Their Old Testament is being replaced with a better testament, a better covenant. The old round of wine is replaced with the better round of wine. And you see that all throughout the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a book that explains the cross and the New Testament to Israel. Because they didn't get it, obviously. That's what Hebrews, and all, all through Hebrews, it's better blood, better sacrifice, better promises, better covenant, better, 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 better. Everything's better now. And that's what Jesus is showing here in this miracle, that the second round of wine is better than the first. The second covenant is better than the first. And I'll just read to you real quick, Hebrews 8, 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. So, in this context of John 2, the better wine could be likened to the covenant. The, better, the second is better than the first. So, just to wrap it up real quick, marriage and Jesus is there, okay? Kingdom, New Testament, Israel gets their kingdom. They have no wine, okay? That's illustrating they can't keep the covenant. Water is put in purifying pots. The water couldn't purify, the water couldn't provide what they needed for the marriage. They needed something better. They needed something supernaturally provided. Blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit. Um, God provided it. And finally, the New Testament replaces the old. The second round of wine is better than the first. So that's what I see in my study as I read <laughs> through this. And I'm probably the only guy in town that does. <laughs> because everybody else just tells stories. <laughs> It'll be greater later. <laughs> that's No. There's... It's, it really is interesting. And when you get off of the subject of whether, the boo, whether it was booze or grape juice, you can, oh, there's really a lot here, and it's really cool why he did this miracle. So I hope you enjoyed all that. That'll be all for this week. We'll pick up in verse 12 next time, unless I change my mind and decide I'm talking about something else, which I claim the prerogative to be able to do. Let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer.